Nobody asked for another podcast, so here you go, this is yet another intro podcast. Hi everyone, and welcome to our fourth episode of yet another intro podcast. We have a great AI-filled episode for you today. We are fortunate enough to join by some of the brightest minds in AI. Widow Appenzeller from A16Z, Moina Dean from Mosaic ML, and Alex Kleber from Moment Vadev. Some of the topics we'll be covering include who owns a generative AI platform, is fine-tuning really necessary in this new world of foundation models, and Stephen Pierce's book about how the mind creates language. Hope you enjoy. Guido, you have recently published a blog post titled Who Owns a Generative AI Platform with your colleagues from A16Z, where you argued that infra companies will be the most likely winners of this market. What makes you come to this conclusion and what are the implications for the other players? Yeah, thank you. It was a very fun article that we wrote together with um, Matt Bornstein and Martin Casado. And I think the what you said, the conclusion is absolutely correct, right? That we think, at least so far, what we're seeing is a lot of the value is accruing in the infrastructure layer of the AI stack. And it's not entirely surprising. If you think about any gold rush that you've ever heard of, right? In the early days, it's often the guys that makes the picks and the shovels that, that, that get the early benefits and are profitable. So if you take a step back, let me just briefly describe the stack for those folks that, that haven't read the post. The very bottom of a modern AI stack is usually the hardware that runs the AI algorithms, right? And we have NVIDIA there as the dominant vendor, right? The A100 cards. And one will keep me honest here, probably the, uh, the workhorse of first AI development today. And uh, NVIDIA is hosting fantastic Waters, so they're making a lot of money. And all that despite crypto as an industry having more or less collapsed, right? So they were basically smoothly able to transition despite using one of their primary use cases, the entire product portfolio to this new AI setup of applications. Now, on top of that, we have for the cloud providers, and we have some of the classical ones like AWS and Azure with their clouds, very successful. But then we're also now seeing some specialty providers like CoreWeave or Lambda, right? They basically are really focusing on providing the best possible platform for AI type of both inference and learning applications. In, and some of them are doing very well. They're growing very quickly, as you would expect. And they also, you know, were able to, to transition. Some of them <laughs> used to cater to the crypto community. They also were able to transition back to a new customer base in the AI space very smoothly. And then total is getting more complicated. You have different models that are competing. And in part, this is because in, in an early market like the current one, and that will probably endure to some degree as the market matures, you have a combination of vertically integrated players and more horizontally layered players. So and they each have their pros and cons. And we have, if you look at somebody who's completely vertically integrated, you have somebody like OpenAI, right? If you're using DALI, the image generation, um, you're basically using a consumer-facing website made by OpenAI with a model by OpenAI, hosted by OpenAI, it's basically a complete stack uh, all provided by them. And then the other end of the spectrum, you have cases where I might be using on my mobile phone, one of these AI avatar type, type applications that basically allows me to make some avatars based on some training uh, photos that I send. In those cases, you have, like in some cases, you have the application company that builds the iPhone app, but they actually don't host the model themselves, but they go to a company like a Replicate that actually hosts the model for them. And then underneath that, you have the folks from Stability and their partners that actually built the stable diffusion model itself. So we're seeing a three-tier structure. So it's really fascinating to see this emerge. It's the early days, but I think we have a first, at least hypothesis, how the initial stack looks like. Awesome. And on the question of the gold rush, and I hear this analogy used quite a lot, but the first winners of a gold rush are actually the people who are mining the gold, right? It's only the picks and shovels the players win after there is an overabundance of people that are trying to mine the gold. So isn't that maybe a case for the apps at least capturing a lot of the initial value? It's interesting. I'm actually not sure which which comes first there because you know you first before I can find gold I need the pick. <laughs> so I think I think the in, in many cases the the revenue from the end users comes after an application has been built and the whole infrastructure underneath has been built and the models have been trained and uh, all of these steps need the hardware. That said, we are seeing in several verticals we are seeing application companies generating substantial revenue. Right, so we're seeing a value increase through at the the infrastructure layer at the very bottom, but we're also seeing value at the very top of the application companies. Three verticals, just to, uh, I can point out where we see substantial, so over 100 million aggregate run rate across the entire industry at this point. One is like code completion. If you used Copilot to do coding, I completely love it. Specifically, if you're learning a new framework or learning a new language, it can give you a great speed up in development. So uh, Microsoft, I think, is doing very well with their, with their GitHub Copilot product. There's a couple of other ones that have similar products like Revlon. They're doing, there's substantial revenue coming there. We have a second vertical, 
is around uh, text generation for marketing and some adjacent fields where we have companies like Jasper. If I want to just write a newsletter for my fitness studio or something like that, so something, a fairly simple task, they basically provide a front and the back is powered by something like GPT-3, where I can basically give it a couple of keywords, tell it roughly what I want, and then it generates that marketing copy for me. And I know the third one, uh, image generation, is also generating substantial revenue, right? The mid-journeys and dallies and stable diffusions of the world. But it's just about creating art, either from a generic model or from a fine-tuned model that you train on your, uh, on your own liking, so you can generate uh, Captain America pictures of yourself. Alex, I would love for you to hear your thoughts as well. I think one thing we talked about on the chat, which I'd love to get more of your thoughts on, Guido, is I think Google's original play was a fairly undifferentiated, mostly public algorithm implemented inside the product. And when you think about why Google became Google, I don't think it's, I don't think it's actually just the fact that they did a better job of building the product. I think it's because they viewed infrastructure as a fundamental competitive advantage when other companies did not. Like live search at the time did not. I think Yahoo at the time did not think about it in the same way exactly. It does seem like people are actually outsourcing the one part of the stack that we do know is defensible, which is mm -hmm. all of the infrastructure that it takes to develop and run all of these algorithms and um, to integrate them into a product that everybody uses. So I guess my question is, now that you've done all of this exploration in the space, do you, does that strike you as being completely naive or off base? Or is that like more or less, is that another way of saying the same thing about infrastructure providers accruing the most value? I think this is a really good question. And look, the, we don't know the answer for AI yet, but I think your, your analogy with Google is quite apt, right? That in, in the question is always, for a company, what is the core competency? What are the differentiators? If something is non-critical to you, you can outsource this and just build it on top of somebody else. If something is really a thing you want to use to differentiate from your competitors, you typically want to pull it in-house and really excel and make it better. And look, my current gut feeling is it depends a little bit on how central AI is to your business model, right? If you're doing image generation, you're probably completely outsourcing everything to somebody else. It's probably not going to work long term. On the other hand, these mobile apps, they do a lot of other things with avatars and chat and so on, right? So for them, it's almost a bit more like a feature. If it's like a feature, then I think it makes a ton of sense to, to outsource it to, to another provider. So my guess is we'll see a combination there, right? And for those companies that this is a very central part of the value offering, I agree. They should probably pull it in-house and they should invest expertise to do it. This thing that makes it a bit more complicated, which is some of the leading models at this point are open source. So we've seen this in images where initially, I think all the hype was around DALI. And then the folks from Stable Diffusion came. And you can have a long discussion which model is better or not. But at this point, Stable Diffusion has just built such a fantastic ecosystem around the core model. You have UIs, you have tools, you have all kinds of scripts. And uh, over time, I think that becomes a competitive advantage. But I think sort of open source foundations, just like you see in the rest of infrastructure, is also something we want to see in AI. Moid, as our resident AI expert on the server, would love to hear your thoughts as well. Yeah, I think there's a couple of good points here. And, and Alex Atrit alluded to a couple of them. One is the one that I'm curious about is I think infrastructure comes in waves. And I wonder if the first movers are really the ones that are going to win here. First mover advantage is usually something that's heavily overrated in my opinion. So for instance, what we've seen here is OpenAI is taking like a deductive approach. They're just developing this model and seeing what it can do. And they're trying to sell the applications. And you have these applications building on top. A lot of these infrastructure players are like, great, I'm building infrastructure, but for who? What are the applications? So I think we're going to see an infrastructure boom once we have a couple more concrete applications around. And for instance, Jasper motivated a ton, and that's when Streamverse ran after a certain workload because they knew that was a workload that they could tackle. Similarly, I think now you're going to have a couple more image makers as well. And once you have these concrete workloads, then it becomes easier to build some infrastructure to tackle them. So that's why I wonder if we're going to have a second wave of infrastructure that's a little more mature, a little more developed with a few, little set of fleshed out applications. So that's my first thought. I still think there's a lot more to do on AI applications that I think we've barely hit the wave. Uh, everyone is pointing towards search and deep zone and Google as a strong area. I think those are relatively diluted, actually. I think it, there will be better search engines, but it's not going to look like a chatbot that just overtakes Google. It's going to be new UI UX entirely. And that's going to take a couple of years to get to. Wait, uh, what are your thoughts? Are we going to change all search to be a chat box or Google will probably still going to continue to dominate the search space? Boy, I think I'm with more that. We will see influence on search engines from these new technologies. There's no question, right? For certain types of questions, such as TVT is at this point, I think is better in, in answering the question. But at the same time, 
to build a search engine is so much more than just uh, typing in a string and getting a result. You need to build this massive infrastructure that constantly crawls the web, guarantees freshness of my various indices, right, feeding this in. And I think we're light years away from just training an AI model on all of that in, in real time, right? And once we have it, you probably still want something that's a bit more modular, like, for example, how I display an image versus a text result. You probably want a different kind of markup. So it's probably not going to be a chat interface. It's probably going to be more of a list or tabular interface that we have right now. If I'm looking for a very simple factoid, right? What's the capital of Lithuania or something like that? Okay, that, that I can just come back with a single answer. But in many cases, it's much more nuanced that I want to see what are the uh, the top facts about uh, Alex Klammer, then I probably want a list of things so I can answer through them and uh, to understand which one is one that I actually care about. So let me actually propose a provocative question about this. The way we actually go to websites and the way we surf the web, we basically look for answers. And there's many companies, and we think about company websites, that are basically trying to give us information in the way that is optimized for people who want to click on stuff and some HTML that is like this 30 year technology for actually thinking about how to build websites. Now with a technology like ChatGPT, could we actually rethink about what even a website is? And maybe a website could be just this text box where I ask questions in order to get my information, as opposed to trying to go with this top nav bar to find the answers and clicking through them. Do we have time for an anecdote? Because I have a story about why it's difficult to serve a service for a billion people on planet Earth. So in about 2013, there was a blog post from Read Write Web and it got posted. It was a normal blog post. And the title was something like Facebook wants to be the login for the internet or something. And everything was fine for the first like eight hours of this blog post life. And then suddenly they started getting like thousands of comments where people were asking totally, totally nonsense stuff. Like, why did you change it? Like, I like the old way better. I can't find my friends or whatever. And what happened was for like maybe 15 minutes in the search index, it had become the number one result for Facebook login. And for an entire class of humans, right, the way to get to Facebook is to type Facebook login into the Google Chrome Omni bar and then just click whatever the first result is. And they couldn't actually tell the difference between the first result and, and Facebook.com. They thought that the site had just gotten redesigned. Search is like the platonic ideal of products. It's a single text box. All you have to do is type text into it and you get what you want, right? It's the simplest possible product. It has no other buttons. You just type some text and press enter. And even that is confusing to some number of people on the internet. It is like one silly little example, but I think it, it does a good job of explaining like how complicated this domain is, how complicated it is to actually serve a page to 4 billion people. You have to have all of this infrastructure for determining when something goes wrong, why something goes wrong, for detecting ranking anomalies. Like, how do we even detect something like that? The fact that we know this happened is interesting, right? Like, it implies this incredible amount of machinery in the relevance pipeline. And so when I think about where, where are we with chat GPT, it is a technology that does really well on tasks right now. But it's not web scale infrastructure ready product work, right? It's going to take a long time before we have that kind of operational maturity where we can pull all of this stuff in and make a like broad consumer product that replaces something like web search. There's all of these other product questions that, that we have to answer. Like when you think about what a search engine does functionally, it's 60% of search results are what we call replaceable. So you get the same information, in the top five search results. Um, that's very cheap, very cheap for Google to serve. A huge percentage of search results have a local component. That's very cheap for Google to serve. And just given the volume of those queries, it's like, how is GPT going to compete with that stuff? It's, it's not a straightforward answer. I'm not saying that we can't answer them or like somebody isn't going to get started now and it's going to like grow into something, but it's not going to be a thing that happens tomorrow. Even if you look at u.com's offering, it's to me, it seems like they're trying to marry traditional information retrieval with the product experience of having a chat app that can do all of this stuff. Anyway, a rambly answer, but I don't see this on the horizon like in the near future. I think it's more likely that you'll see it pop up in little silos and become heavily leveraged in places where, where knowledge retrieval and synthesis is really hard. And there isn't like an established company. Yeah. A couple of thoughts there, actually. It's interesting to assess people with their use cases of ChatGPT. I've heard a lot of lay people say, oh, yeah, I use ChatGPT daily whenever I have any questions. That's intriguing because the experts I know are the exact inverse, but they actually don't trust it very much. And I think you have this effect where actually the experts are very distrustful of this new technology because they know how it works. And you actually have that curse of knowledge. The way I perceive ChatGPT is almost like an intellectual spawning partner. 
where if I'm trying to make an argument for something, I'll text chat GPT action. I'll be like, hey, let's discuss if corporations should be people representing the law case of Citizens United versus FEC. What, give me the bull case and the bear case for this. It'll actually give me a very good like reasoned argument for the bull case and bear case if corporations should be people. So I use it as a sounding board for my own thoughts rather than in any information retrieval system. And my personal prediction is I think this is where that technology will head, where people use it as a partner to discuss things with before they go and discuss things with actual human beings. That's my gut instinct. Awesome. Let's take this discussion forward and kind of switch gears a little bit about the foundation models that behind technologies like ChatGPT. So there was recently a very engaged discussion that started off a conversation between Martin and Suhail of Mixpanel, Mighty, and Flagger on AI, where Suhail basically argued that fine-tuning models is futile and everyone should just wait for the foundation models to be good enough for those specific tasks. Moin, what are your thoughts on that argument? Yeah, that's a good question. First, let's start by discussing what like a foundation model is and the concept of pre-training versus fine-tuning. So a foundation model is something, a model that is capable of many tasks. And it's something that people have pre-trained once already and they've eaten the cost and then they serve in per inference query cost or some amortized cost in order to make up the cost of pre-training to you as an API. So that's a foundation model. You can also, people can release the weights for free, something that they do with like in kind. So that's a foundation model. This foundation model is usually pre-trained via self-supervision. So it's basically, imagine your iPhone autocomplete, right? You have a long sentence of text and you're just trying to predict the next word in that text. Now, fine-tuning a foundation model for GPT-3 is actually the same code path as pre-training it. In other words, fine-tuning a foundation model for a user is akin to OpenAI just saying, hey, here's a pre-training code path. Give us your data set and we will just rerun that code path on your data set. So what Sohail is referring to, it's a very real concept. And the concept is as pre-training gets better and better, the need for fine-tuning diminishes. This in the literature is known as something as transfer learning, which is the better, better pre-trained model you have, the better it is at transfer learning. And then you can go from doing K examples at inference to one to zero. And the dream of all ML researchers is to create a model that will require zero examples to actually run inference on and fine tune. You won't need to fine tune at all. So, but, so Hill is rather correct in that example. Practically speaking, I think what will happen is people with significantly different domains in the training corpus will always need to fine tune. So for instance, if you're doing something in the medical domain where we have botched text, such as medical billing codes, which just don't even look like human text, or if you have things in the legal domain or things in very particular domains, then you might need to fine tune a lot more. And basically what we're going to see is as your use case differs more and more from the text found on the internet, the more you'll need fine tune. And you should ask yourself how many people really have that. Weirdo also has this interesting point where it's like your fine tuning use cases, once they become a class, the foundation model API might just put that back into the model. So if let's say there are 50 use cases, let's say like legal, medical, then why wouldn't the foundation model provider just include those in the pre-training tech, get a copy of the US constitution, get a copy of the IRS bill codes, include that in the pre-training text, because it seems like a large class of applications that I should just include as my part, as being over as all provider. I think that's a fair case. The time will tell which case actually ends up running out. Guido, one of the cases that were made for this position that Fender and Mall are all you need is basically the analogy was hardware and how many companies who actually try to create their own hardware did not go far with that and they just had to wait for Intel or Nvidia's chips to catch up and just use them. So where do you stand on this discussion? It's super interesting. I think we're still seeing this evolve and I'm not sure we, we know yet what the answer is, but the two, I think, interesting observations that both came out of the chat. One is that if you fine tune a model, you can often get better performance or you can make the model smaller for a particular purpose or more quickly. Yeah. At the same time, there's a certain factor there. So maybe I need 10 X the effort to train a general foundation model that includes the subset versus if I just train on the fine tune or train on that subset alone. I can do it much, much faster. And that sort of tells us is that there may be a trade-off here to say, look, if a special domain is large enough, it may make sense to train a model on that, right? That may be more, maybe cheaper at the end of the day, right? Because then the amount of cycles I spend on this is worth it versus making my foundation model X times larger. On the other hand, if this is a domain that is not used very frequently, it may just make sense to train the foundation model longer because then I can basically amortize the use across a bunch of different domains and it's actually cheaper to use foundation models with just clever prompting or something like that. So I think we might see slightly different models emerge there. So we keep hearing from the AI community that 
Transformers is all you need. Attention is all you need. Foundation Miles is all you need. Do I actually believe that there is like this one choose your favorite is all we need in this space? It's actually an interesting question of how much people will prompt versus fine tune and when they will do those things. Um, prompting is a wild west, right? It didn't really exist for a while. OpenAI discovered that you can do it at extremely large scale. And for a while, we thought it only worked at extremely large scale. And then people figured out that you could actually prompt at various levels. Uh, so for instance, there's no reason you can't prompt 110 million parameter model. And the same methods to prompt actually work reasonably well. It's just that scale makes prompting actually useful, empirically useful. So Sarah C from Amplify, me, and uh, I ended up pinging Sharif Shamim from Let's Go as well. We're discussing when you'd want to prompt in practice versus when you want to fine tune. The skeptical take I have is who is actually prompting in practice? And do they prompt for a while and then just start fine tuning their models? So Sharif gave a really good heuristic, which aligns with my intuition exactly. And he said, you prompt if you thought or chain of thought prompting gives good results and you don't need anything better. And generalization accuracy, i.e. your user's inputs are very similar. So generalization accuracy is not critical. You want to fine tune when Compton fails. If you have a training data set, it totally makes sense to fine tune. And accuracy and speed is very critical. And I think that latter point is extremely important where speed is also very critical. From what I've surveyed, the empirical distribution of when people use these foundation models is half of the real use cases are real time and half of them are batched. For the real time use cases, you probably actually want to train a smaller foundation model or fine tune one of the smaller ones because you won't have a real time use case where latency is critical. And you also have a use case where accuracy is extremely important. For the batch use cases, we might see people rely on the API a little more because you can use the larger models because you won't need to fine tune. And then generally, I think the people doing batch use cases might be a little less sophisticated. So they might not have the talent to create something real time. No, I think those are great points. To add one more thing to that, I think it might also depend a little bit on what kind of model you're actually using. Like right now, if I have, say, an image model and I want to train it to generate uh, images of Italy, then my only choice really is to take that model and fine tune it on, on the pictures of them in order to generate outputs. I think uh, doing this with a prompt is not something we can do today, right? No matter how well I describe him, it won't quite look like him because Human language can't express all the parameters in a face. On the other hand, for text models, I think it seems to be working a lot better, right? For G what I can do with GPT-3 with prompting to basically make it fit for certain special use cases is completely mind-boggling, right? It's incredibly good at sentiment analysis, uh, despite it never being designed for that, just by giving a good prompt that instructs it to perform that particular task. I think that's actually a pretty interesting take because I, I guess I'm curious to hear why you think that a little bit, because in my view, what it indicates is that there's a wide variety of domains and tasks, like natural language tasks that are a lot more similar than we had originally thought. But if you go and you do something like legal search or try to summarize medical texts or something, GPT does not strike me as particularly useful for those things. And I think if we start to look at domain specific areas, especially where specificity really matters, we will find that it doesn't actually generalize that much. So it's not, but it sounds like you disagree with that. I think at the end of the day, it boils down to the point that was made earlier by Moin, which is that in order for a model to be effective on a certain domain, that domain has to be part of the training set. Today, like GPT-3, GPT-3.5 is trained on something that's reasonably close to all preserved human generated text within a factor of 10, I would say, because it includes the web crawl, Wikipedia, like large collection of books. So... Can we do go up another factor of 10? I don't know, maybe, right? Can we go another factor of 100? Probably not. There's just not enough change there. So we're getting close to a point where we say, okay, it's trained on all texts in the world. What percentage of all legal texts in the world is it trained on? Probably a much smaller percentage. I don't know the numbers, but it's probably much, much less. And to, to what percentage of all image of images of Alex Clamor is stable diffusion trained on? That, that's a very tiny percentage. Right? Oh, it's zero. So if you have the training set at all. So I think the it, it, this is what really what it boils, boils down to, right? If I have a model and I wanted to do something in a domain that wasn't included in the training set, then I need to fine tune to add that. I think that if you look at the total corpus of like things that you would want to ingest as a language model for law, right? The corpus is never going to be that big. And, but the things that you do ingest, it's really important that you ingest them with like really high fidelity and you are preserving all of the relationships that are important to preserve. Because when you're doing something like trying to retrieve all of the precedent for case law, it's really important that you get all of it. If you don't get some of it, you will lose your case. But when I think about, when I think about what large language models are good at, it is not a priori obvious to me that they are going to be well suited to domains like that in general. And so far they don't seem to be well designed for that space. And I guess I'm wondering, it seems like your position is CPUs in the night in the late nineties, right? If you just wait for a bit, the foundation models are going to get huger and like, they're going to learn more stuff. And then they're going to have 
more power. And it seems like you think that they are actually going to get better at these tests. I guess maybe because the foundational knowledge augments that the legal stuff or because you just think like open AI engineers are going to get better at making sure the kinks are ironed out in those domains where specificity does matter or something else. I think a really interesting question to ask, it's slightly orthogonal to Alex's point, but I think it'll be similar, is what does this industry look like? Is this industry actually look like the hardware industry, especially like the independent hardware providers of the late 80s, early 90s? Does it look like SaaS? Does it look like fabricating a chip? What does this industry look like? I'm hoping it looks like SaaS because then you can do things like continued learning. It'll be a continuous workload rather than a one-off workload. But there's arguments to be made that creating a foundation model might look at, like a TSM or an ARM workload. We're going to spend a while taping out this chip. In other words, you're going to spend a while training this foundation model, and then you're going to sell it for a while, and then you're going to go tape out a new chip for a while, rather than taking one foundation model and continuously improving upon it. If that's the case, then actual fundamental business looks different, and the challenges for the business looks different. So I think this question of analogy, while we might be stretching it, I think it's an important question to ask. I think one element that was lost in the entire discussion that I felt uh, was not addressed properly is we were looking for this question from kind of one lens, which is, let's say, accuracy, precision, or recall. But we haven't talked much about efficiency. So Guido, one of the questions I had is if you have a model that was trained on Italian literature and, you know, Ethiopian cooking, is that really necessary if I now have a specific application of, let's say, writing blog posts for my B2B SaaS website, and should I pay that extra inference cost on all of that additional information? Or do you believe that it will be so well amortized that it'll, the foundation model will do a better job with a better unit economics? Yeah, great question. My, my current gut feeling is that obviously the Italian literature is not necessary for your blog post. I not, don't know your blog post, but I'm guessing. At the same time, these models are sufficiently large that it may not matter, right? Having it look at more data, even if it's outside of your domain, probably has no substantial negative effect as long as you have enough parameters to retain that knowledge, right? And it looks like these the large foundation models today have plenty of storage capacity, so to speak, to remember all these factoids. So it seems like if you have more parameters, then you have higher chance of any particular prompt being incoherent. So in other words, the answer to a prompt generally is local to wherever the prompt lands in like prompt space, right? You're going to get an answer where the beliefs are like local to what the prompt is. And if you prompt the model differently, you could get like a different answer. And my question is like, it seems like as you have a larger model, you are going to have a trade-off in like coherence between answers, right? And it's going to be harder to make sure that answer is actually coherent where it's important to be coherent. Is that wrong or is that? Somebody did an online experiment where they basically took a language model and gave it as a prompt something along the lines of, hi, I'm a 65-year-old plumber living in rural Texas. I go to church twice a week and creating a very stereotype conservative and then ask about what is the role of government in a society? Should it be big or small government? And the model came back with, oh, a small government is good. And then it did the, you know, sort of opposite with the, I don't know, cappuccino slurping San Franciscan tech bro. And you sort of got the opposite where it was like, oh, no, a, a big government is good. We need this. And which I think breaks your point a little bit that you have to be careful with what prompt you wish for. Huh? Yeah, and then there's this whole field called alignment, which is basically trying to instill some form of ethical beliefs or trying to align models intentions with human intentions. So it's basically trying to get rid of this whole behavior. So you can mitigate it with alignment to some degree that I believe the models have. So in other words, an unaligned model at scale will exhibit parroting behavior, but via alignment, you can get rid of that parroting behavior and have some intrinsic beliefs in the model. What Guido was saying earlier is if you have more parameters, you can capture a reasonable amount of the relationships in a corpus. And my question is, I'm trying to understand like what the trade-off is between the what you capture and how you interface with it. It seems it seems like a lot of work in foundational models is making sure the overall experience is good, maybe not completely coherent, but like good enough to be serviceable for like consumer cases like chat GPT is. And I would expect that is a direct trade-off that you make if you're trying to be something that is high fidelity, preserving really important relationships, has ground truth, like you would expect for something in law or medicine. That's like total speculation, but it's a thing that I wonder, and I'd love to hear if that is a thing that is borne out in research or not. This is a phenomenon in the literature known as catastrophic forgetting. This is a phenomenon that's nothing new. It's been around since, let's say, 2008, maybe 2012. Basically, what this is, the idea is if you take a model and you continue training it, at some point, the model forgets what it learned. So this indicates this idea that you can't take a model and just continue training it into infinity. 
because at some point you're going to saturate your parameters and then you need to either take a give model with no more parameters which means you need to train from scratch or learn how to grow a model that's another active area of research is how can i take a 100 million parameter model make it into a 200 million parameter model but you can't just take a model and train it to infinity without forgetting something and in practice this also happens i was a little surprised i talked to a couple self-driving car companies and i was like hey is this a theoretical problem that only researchers work on or is this a problem in practice where you actually train the model from scratch and yes whatever we retrain the model we initialize with new weights and we train on like for instance the last two weeks of data because it forgets what happened last month so no one actually does this full-on continual training to the best of my knowledge um and this actually indicates quite a few things in industry at least if you're training the models you will train from scratch take your new data set shuffle it entirely and then train that new model from scratch rather than taking your own model and continuing training it and training it because this seems to be a problem in practice i want to take this discussion a little bit meta and talk about other things that are happening on the yeg discord server another popular channel on the server is a reading list where people recommend their favorite books and blog posts and Alex, recently you have stated that the language instinct, uh, Stephen Pinker's book, How the Mind Creates Languages, is your favorite pop science book. Please tell us more about it and what do you think makes it so great? Yeah, I think Martin also either, I forget what he said, I think he might have said it's also his favorite. So the language instinct is remarkable, both because of the subject matter and because of the way that it is written. So in the late 50s, there was a like, intellectual crisis maybe the only time in modern history that an honest to god thomas kuhn style scientific revolution happened happened in the late 50s and it was in linguistics and the thing that was sh so shocking about it is that we discovered that in some sense we basically know nothing about the primary tool that we use to interface with each other and with the rest of the world and the way that we think about things we essentially know nothing about it at like a structural level and the thing that triggered this whole crisis was at the time, linguistics, in the words of John Searle, was like a verbal botany. It's like you collect all the words, and then you say, this is an adjective, this is a verb, this is a noun, and then you're like, done. And that's what linguistics is. And you had people like B.F. Skinner, the famous behavioralist, saying, we are just parroting back like fragments of sentences at each other infinitely. That's what language is. What Chomsky pointed out is that pretty much every sentence that you ever say in real life, ever, is completely unique in human history, including this one. And that has profound implications. It means that it can't just be the case that we're just parroting bits of fragments of words back to each other. It means that there is a structure, a grammar for these, the way that we construct sentences. And this totally melted people's brains. It's because the implication of that is like the thing that you and I use every day, the thing that I'm using to talk to you on this podcast right now is a thing that we fundamentally actually did not understand how it worked at all. We didn't understand basic facts about how this works. It's one of the reasons why he's one of the most, he's the most cited academic author of all time, at least maybe before all this GPG stuff. I don't know if somebody went up higher or whatever, but it was, it changed sort of our conception, not only of like how language works, but it started to unfurl all of this other stuff that it changed the way that we think about psychology and changed the way that we think about neurology and like it has impacts on computer science and stuff like this. And so it's about this insane event where like all of academia had to rip down literally hundred percent of the field and replace it with new stuff because they realized that they're completely wrong about the thing they literally use every day. And the thing that is really great about the book is it captures all of the richness and all of the interesting things about this event in a way that can be that anybody can understand. And that's extremely rare in, in popular science. I'll give you like one anecdote. So the reason it's called the language instinct is because it appears to be the case that humans have an instinct to acquire language or make one up if one is not available to them. The reason we know this is because in the 50s, when the Nicaraguan government got restructured, they created these deaf schools and consolidated all of these deaf children from the Nicaraguan countryside and put them inside real deaf schools. And the objective of these schools, if I remember correctly, was to teach them pantomimes and lip reading. And what happened instead is that all these kids who had no uniform language came together and then spontaneously invented a morphologically rich sign language that is like an actual language when nobody taught them this, right? Because it was against the rules. And that indicates that there's an instinct of people to like socially take what is around them and structure it as language. And that in, in itself was also very surprising. So the book is interesting on both of those levels, both because it's just extremely well-written and because it is about something which is just really interesting and something that I think we're probably not likely to see again in our lifetimes. 
this is awesome. Thank you, Alex, for introducing uh, this to us. And that also reminds me of a different conversation we had on the channel about whether natural language is actually the right interface for us to live our lives. And one of the things, Guido, that these AGI doomsayers bring up is that it's actually very hard to communicate using kind of natural language with machines. So one of the examples, if I say now to a self-driving car, get me to the airport as fast as possible, they might take it literally and kill me while doing it. What do you think should be the proper, let's say, API for all of this power that we're unlocking? I'm not quite sure what AGI is at the end of the day, so I'm going to stay away a little bit from that. I think there's a lot of fantasy going on there and people speculating. In terms of ambiguity, don't see this as a big issue, frankly. And I think the reason is that if you look at how today words are processed, you know, how they transform to embeddings, right? There is always a certain amount of uncertainty around any input that one of these modern text-to-text -text or text-to-speech type models um, parses. And it's pretty good in getting what it misses uh, in terms of meaning of the individual word from the context. And I think we're also seeing the systems that you build with these models, we're seeing them getting better just asking if they need a clarification, right? If, if I have a very low, like you could ask GPT-3 and give it a sentence and ask him, are you sure you understand what XYZ means? And it'll probably give you a fairly reasonable answer that says, ah, actually, I'm not sure. And, and then if, once you have that, you can use that to then basically ask a, cl a clarifying question. So I think there's actually a lot we can do there. Now, all of that said, I think there's some areas for example, let me take image generation here, right? We're having something that looks more like a markup language would actually be highly beneficial, right? And today I can say, I want an image of two, two Yag chat participants standing next to each other, right? And it'll, uh, if, I, if it has an idea how a Yag chat participant looks like, it'll generate that image. But if I say, I want them to be exactly 10 feet apart, right? There's really no good way of doing this, right? If the kind of annotated images that, the, that were trained, that these models were trained on, they don't have this kind of precise quantitative information in it. So if I wanted to lay out a scene, I can't do this, right? So it would be really nice if you could actually maybe train one of these models on synthetic data that you tie to tags and then have something that looks a little bit more like an HTML or so, or like a markup language that where I can describe a scene, how exactly I want something composed. One of the questions that academia has been asking is how can we contribute? And I've seen a lot of people work on prompting in academia instead of, for instance, training of these models of the rich system thrums that accompany that. I think one area that a lot of academics are working on is creating that DSL. But World Adopt has this paper around writing a DSP instead, where you demonstrate search predict and you can write composition of prompts together in a certain way. So imagine that the next step from here naturally is how can you write like a DSL for prompting? And I think things like land chain are touching upon this. I think like things like demonstrate search predictor touching upon this. And I see that as the natural next frontier. Um, the question is, how do you do that ambiguity directly? If you look at the history of computer science, it's like we've taken high level and low level languages and then made them higher and higher level as time goes on. And I think natural language prompting or some level of prompting with a very structured language that's very easy for beginners to use is seems to be the next frontier in that. Awesome. Moin, Guido, and Alex, thank you so much for joining us today for this fascinating episode and hope the listeners will like it. So thank you. Thank you.